Yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. Welcome to Rome Meals Banana Quitting Jazz channel via StreamYard as we get the opportunity to share with you the Black Repertory Group Barrow Bond Theater 59th uninterrupted season of main stage productions. This evening's pro production of the Jimi Hendrix Experiment by, by and performed by Jerome Preston Bates is dedicated to Gene Bowen, who gave Jimmy motherly care when she was on the and he was on the West Coast. Since the Black Repertory Group was birthed in a church, the Downs United Methodist Church, it's so very apropos that we have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that has gathered here today. We pray that this work will be consecrated and sent out to the audience that may come to hear. May the speaker be blessed, may the words be anointed, and may those that have come together to bring this broadcast, and that includes the Black Repertory Theater in Berkeley, California, Dr. Mona Scott and Sean Von Scott. We pray, Father, even now, that you bless us in a most magnificent way, that your light so shine that Many women will see this work and your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
James Marshall Hendricks, born November 27, 1942 in Seattle, Washington, so easily misunderstood, so often misinterpreted, so often misrepresented. If big hair, bright clothes, and loud frenzy sounds from a Fender guitar is what you imagine when the name Jimi Hendrix is spoken, well, that's one dimensional. If rock and roll a misuse, rock and roll a misuse of substance and the impact of a psychedelic era rolled into confusion is your intrusion, then you are far from being on the right track. You see, we all have a beginning. Yet what ushers us into adulthood is a compound of many components, many experiences, many steps and missteps, many forms of information, interpretation, misunderstanding, and many rotations of misinformation. A son, a baby boy is born unto a young Seattle couple. His father, Al Hendricks, a young man, a native of Georgia, and his mother, Lucille Jeta, although very little is known of her birthplace, but more than likely a Seattle native with lineage that traces to Canada. Lucille was born two months premature to Clarice and Preston Jeter, and his dad, Al Hendricks, Nora Rose Moore Hendricks, Dale Al Hendricks' parents, Nora Rose Moore Hendricks, was born in Georgia. His father, Bertrand Philander Ross Hendricks, was born in Urbana, Ohio. They were entertainers in a traveling vaudeville theatrical show. Al Hendricks' mom was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian. Al Hendricks fancied dancing and jazz music. He was a skilled jazz dancer dancing to well-known jazz men like Fletcher Henderson and Louis Armstrong. Hello, Dolly, this is Louis. Dolly, it's so nice to have you back where you belong. You're looking swell. Dolly, I can tell. Dolly, you keep going, you keep growing, you keep going strong. Al and Lucille began to date and frequent the Seattle clubs, dancing the ball in the jack, the Texas Tommy, the ring shout, the cake walk, the Charleston and other dances of that era. And so this union of Lucille and Al Hendricks begat a son, James Marshall Hendricks, a younger brother, Leon Hendricks, and his baby brother, Joe Hendricks. So here's the story. Sit tight and enjoy the ride, for it's a Jimi Hendrix experiment. Yeah, yeah, so here we go to revisit a story from long, long ago of Jimmy as a young lad growing up and living with his dad, Al, who was taking care of his sons, Jimmy, Leon, and Joe. Jimmy's mom, Lucille, was separated from her husband, Al, at the time. His mom, living from place to place with family and friends, would now only see her young son's face <laughs> from place to place. Her young son's face. <laughs> it's not moving. I can do it. A son, a baby boy, born into a young Seattle couple, and his father, Al Hendricks, a young man, a native of Georgia, and his mother, Lucille Jeter, although very little is known of her birthplace, but more than likely a Seattle native with lineage that traces to Canada. Lucille was born two months premature to Clarice and Preston Jeter, and his dad, Al Hendricks, Nora Rose Moore Hendricks, was born in Georgia. 
His father, Bertrand Philando Ross, was born in Urbana, Ohio. They were entertainers in a traveling vaudeville theatrical show. Al Hendricks' mom was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian. Al Hendricks fancied dancing to jazz music. He was a skilled jazz dancer, dancing to well-known jazz men like Fletcher Henderson and Louis Armstrong. Hello, Dolly, this is Louis. Dolly, it's so nice to have you back where you belong. You're looking swell, Dolly, I can tell. Dolly, you're still growing, you're still going, you're still growing strong. Al and Lucille began to date and frequent the Seattle clubs, dancing the ball in the jack, the Texas Tommy, the ring shout, and the cakewalk, the Charleston, and other dances of that era. And so this union of Lucille and Al begat a son, James Marshall Hendricks, a younger brother, Leon Hendricks, and his baby brother, Joe Hendricks. So here's the story. Sit tight and enjoy the ride, for it's a Jimi Hendrix experiment. Yeah, yeah, so here we go to revisit a story from long ago of Jimmy as a young lad growing up and living with his dad, Al, who was taking care of his sons, Jimmy, Leon, and Joe. Jimmy's mom, Lucille, was separated from her husband, Al, at that time. His mom, living from place to place with family and friends, would now only see her young son's face from time to time and mostly not at all. What a rhyme. Jimmy, of course, missed his mom and longed for her love, a love that slowly began to fade, fade away. So his lonely heart leads him to create a world of his own wandering here and there, trying to find his place in the world, attending schools as most lads would at that age, trying to fit in mostly, but standing out. Jimmy began to take interest in sports, even joining the team and bringing home his full regalia of a football helmet, shoulder pads, pants, protective girdle, and cleats for his feet. I bet you never knew he was also a graphic artist, right? <laughs> With his drawings of football teams and race cars and bebop bands and Dagwood Comet and one of his father, Al, sleeping on the family couch. Little Jimmy sitting in the windowsill, reminiscing of his early childhood baby days, of his mom and dad and he and Leon living here, a hotel room there, and relatives reaching out everywhere to show they care. And maybe, just maybe, that when Father Al went to work in the Pacific as a longshoreman, Lucille, his mom, was young, and with Al gone, she left. Little Jimmy was left by his mom with the Mrs. Walls, who would love and keep that child, and just before she passed away, would pass the child on to Mrs. Champ, her sister, who would keep the child Jimmy in her home in Berkeley, California. Jimmy's dad, Al, returning home from his work in the Pacific, would travel to Berkeley to receive his son from a reluctant Mrs. Champ who had grown fond of little Jimmy and didn't want to turn him over to Al, but she did. And as we would later see that it was meant to be, a father and son reunited to take a train back to their Seattle home merrily. Growing up and living with his dad, a modest house, a cat, a dog, little Jimmy began to take interest in music, often raiding the record collections of his dad, Al. Al thumbing through records like Louis Jordan and Muddy Waters and B.B. King and Buddy Holly and Eddie Cochran and Elmore James. Early in Jimmy's team, he began to trade licks on a broomstick given to him by his dad to sweep the floor. Jimmy would often grab his dad's old ukulele and strumming on it until eventually his dad brought him a used acoustic guitar purchased from a friend. Little Jimmy became a guitar slinging hip cat, strumming and humming old songs heard over the radio. 
Songs like Hound Dog by Big Maybell and later Elvis Presley and the local and round RB sounds from national radio stations, tunes by the Coaster and the Platters, maybe Bobby Darren, but music, sweet music was all that mattered. Becoming more interested in music and yet not being able to read music, little Jimmy began to play long and often enough to join the local Seattle bands such as the Velvet Tones and the Rocking Kings. Jimmy would often say, well, you know, I knew about three songs when I was, uh, it was time for us to uh, play on stage. I was all shaky, you know. <laughs> so I, I had to play behind the curtains and everything. I, I just couldn't get up front. And then you get so very discouraged. You, you know, you hear a different guitar players around you and the guitar players always seemed like they were so much better than you. Most people give up at that point, but it's best not to. <laughs> Just keep on keeping on. Uh, sometimes you are going to be so frustrated, frustrated that you hate the guitar, but all of this is just a part of learning. If you're very stubborn, you can make it. A weary teenager, born and unmotivated, he wanted something to do to challenge him, to awake his curiosity, start him off to his destiny to give him the impetus to run free, to be free, to get his music together and see where in this big wide world he was meant to be. Landscaping and gardening with his father's Al's business during the day he had nights to devote his music and play gigs with local bands like the Tomcats. But after going in circles and not making any real money, he strayed and got caught up in local boy fun like riding in stolen cars. However, serving no time for those efforts, thoughtless crimes, he served no time, but instead was issued a suspended sentence that remained on his permanent record. School was a drag and grades were falling down, down, down having been classified as 1-A by the local draft board, he realized he'd either volunteer or wait for an official draft notification. So Jimmy volunteered and, and walked into a local recruiting office to serve in the Air Force. Finally, some organization wanted him, his country, the USA, for surely one day he would play the Star Spangled Banner as a loot to the climate of discontent in America. But first, he joined the 101st Airborne in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, moving and grooving and finding his way, jumping out of planes and training hard until he began to find his music again one day. And so Jimmy was now a military man with the 101st Airborne in Fort Camel, Kentucky's Screaming Eagles Division. He kept to himself mostly, just focusing on his duty as a serviceman and picking up an old guitar when he had some free time. That was good old just me time. He would borrow a friend's guitar from time to time until he was able to get his own, then it was on. Jimmy would practice and play nonstop. He would walk around with the guitar strapped around his neck, even going to bed with the guitar in his belly, often playing the guitar until he went to sleep. One night, Jimmy was playing in his barracks room just rehearsing a few new and sometimes not so new guitar bars and licks trying to find a new sound. Billy Cox, a serviceman, was returning to his room after attending a movie screening at a theater on the base. Billy, walking along, heard this guitar sound that he'd never heard before, a rather crafty, created, unusual sound. He stopped and turned around to a private serviceman walking with him, and he said, hey, you hear that sound? That's some pretty good music. That's some pretty good guitar playing. The private he was walking with did not agree, so he walked away, and Jimmy followed the sound, a most peculiar sound, painting the atmosphere and bouncing around until it led him to Jimmy sitting down with a guitar in his hand. And thus began the partnership of Jimmy and Billy. The first time they would meet and be face to face, Billy introduced himself and said, hey, 
Billy Cox. After a few gigs on the military base and forming the King Casuals, after being overworked and underpaid, Jimmy and Billy realized it was indeed time to move on. Due to an injury to his ankle and back during a parachute jump, Jimmy received an honorary discharge and Billy would receive one as well. And so they would make their way to Nashville. Oh, Nashville. <laughs> A groovy town for good music. However, the fella's just looking for a place to land a steady gig. So a steady gig indeed was landed at Club Del Morocco in Nashville, where groovy guys and gals would see them nightly and hear the sounds of B.B. King, Solomon Burke, and Bobby Blue Bland. <laughs> they were able also to secure a living residency above Joyce's House of Glamour in Nashville. However, Though the gigs were rather steady at Club Morocco, the vision was still too small for Jimmy. He wanted bigger and better, and he wouldn't let anything tie him down. He was determined to move on, not let anything tie him down. And so, after meeting entertainer and concert promoter Gorgeous George, Jimmy was invited to an R&B package tour, playing back up and traveling through the South with Sam Cooke and Jackie Robinson and Hank Battert and other R&B acts of that day. Up until this point, Jimmy's full repertoire included blues, R&B, early 60s, soul and jazz. Jimmy loved and was inspired by all forms of music and sounds and chords and rhythms were formed based on his surroundings of urban life, domestic strife, popular music of the day, and those celestial sounds recreate from his many airplane jumps as a paratrooper in training at the 101st Airborne. Imagining the sounds of wind and rain as it splashed against his parachute and his eye goggles, the wind faster than the speed of sound flowing in and out of his ears, entering his spirit and shaping his imagination towards the sound that would soon flow from his guitar. The experience was glorious, but the pay was lousy. He was still struggling, living from place to place, and he knew something better just had to come. His Nashville days had worn him out. He was done. It was 1964 and Jimmy had made his way to Harlem, smoozing in and out of certain Harlem hot spots such as the Baby Grand and the Small Paradise. He stayed at the Hotel Teresa, then a room here and a room there playing in local bands that gave him a showcase but mostly didn't pay. Then Jimmy met Fane Prickman, a local singer, had made her way from Georgia to Harlem traveling with Volker's little Willie John. Fane's mom would follow soon after to keep a watchful eye on her. Fane was young and full of energy, adventurous, hitting the club scene with Jimmy. Attending shows he played background for to show support. There were other times she and Jimmy would just sit in to watch local musicians and vocalists on the Harlem scene. She helped Jimmy stay on his feet, so to speak, showed him around town and eventually introduced him to one of his friends or her friends and got him an audition for the Isley Brothers. Rumor has it, or at least Ernie Isley has said that during the time that Jimmy stayed with the Isley Brothers at their Teaneck, New Jersey residence, that Ernie Isley would sit in and listen to Jimmy rehearsing and pick up some tricks or a few licks himself. But not only did Jimmy Fane know Jimmy, she also knew and would be around James Brown and Sam Cooke, Otis Redding, and Jackie Wilson, and Eddie James. But particularly, most of the male musical showmen that would frequent Harlem's Apollo Theater. Fane often talked about the time she and Jimmy stayed together sometimes over her mom and eventually having their own place. 
She recalled how her mom couldn't figure Jimmy out and would say, what are you doing with that long-haired guy you always run in the street with? But mostly Fane's mom made sure she and Jimmy were taken good care of. Fane began to pick up on Jimmy's desire to branch out a little more. And his musical taste was changing to where he'd mentioned listening not only to guitarists like Elmore James and B.B. King and Muddy Waters, but now Bob Dylan and Eric Clapton. <laughs> he also began to take interest in traveling downtown to the village to meet musicians there and jam. Now, of course, this time, Jimmy had been a side man to most rhythm and blues front men like Sam Cooke and James Brown or just being available whenever a band would come to town. Bands like the Ike and Tina Turner Review were favorites and of course traveling and playing with the Isley Brothers, man, oh man. <laughs> that was really cool. He would tour with the Isleys to Jamaica West Indies and man, that was out of sight. Jimmy at this point was even invited to come to the studio and record with the Isley Brothers, most notably on the tune Testify. I'm so glad that I got so. I'm so glad that I got so. Well, I just want to testify what your love has done for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jimmy playing with rhythm and blues bland bands and eventually soul bands graduating into funk. Fane could understand. But all of the listening and playing Bob Dylan and traveling to the village, village to get gigs and play rock and pop music, well, Fane just wasn't with that. We got to remember hanging with the likes of James Brown, Sam Cooke, and Otis Redding was hip. But Dylan? <laughs> Who was Bob Dylan? Fane would ask. Jimmy would first take the A-train to Midtown, where he would get gigs at the Cheetah Lounge on 52nd and Broadway. There he would play gigs with Curtis Knight and the Squires at the Cheetah Lounge. They would have outfits designed out of cheetah print cloth to match the King of the Jungle theme. Now, what was that about? Jimmy would meet a cast of characters between the Broadway Midtown area and Greenwich Village. Band like uh, Joey D and the Starlighters, gigs with the likes of Soupy Sales, opening up for Joey D. Jimmy would also meet Juggy Murray, a then popular record producer who had produced Ike and Tina Turner. I'm just a fool in love with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Juggy was also responsible for others in offering Jimmy his first recording contract which Jimmy signed because he wanted to get his music on. He knew something was in his music and expressions of poetic words and lyrics and poetry in motion that wanted to write his name across the sky. I believe in the midst of this, Fane realized she was losing a grip on Jimmy, that he was going south through Midtown to the village and his music expressions and interests were growing. Jimmy eventually formed a band centered around his playing and vocals called Jimmy James and the Blue Fames. Jimmy's birth name was Johnny Allen Hendricks, but was later changed to James Marshall Hendricks. But yes, Jimmy was in evolving and beginning to incorporate in his musical set, Wild Thing, by the Trugs. Songs by Bob Dylan and Hey Joe by Billy Roberts. Hey Joe was later recorded as a more upbeat, rather psychedelic version by the group The Leaves. Yes, fame began to see that Jimmy was growing and outgrowing Harlem, or was at least searching for something new to discover. He was drifting away to a new plateau, a stage that was groovy in his ever involving career. In 2008, I began a 12-year friendship by phone with Miss Litha Fane Prignan. Like many Hendrix listeners, I was blown away by her magnetic, effervescent personality that she presented in the 1971 film, a film about Jimi Hendrix. She spoke candidly about her relationship with Jimi Hendrix, 
during those Harlem years, how they moved about from club to club, how Jimmy was always just a sideman to the cats or musicians he would play with, how they couldn't see the value of his musicianship, how they just wanted to keep him in the background and never let him step forward and really play. How his skill and passion for the guitar was above and beyond anything they could conceive or play. Now, two of my favorite stories were the ones about the cat and the bag and the one about Otis Redding. <laughs> the story goes, Jimmy and Fame was playing, you know, planning to hop the A-train, heading downtown, and Jimmy wanted to bring their cat. <laughs> they would grab a bag, actually an oversized envelope that was given to Jimmy by Fane's mother, who worked for the city of New York, <laughs> where she got those oversized envelopes. Well, because cats and dogs were not allowed on the train, Jimmy has the cat in the bag trying to hide it from the other passengers and the train patrolmen. Well, as often as Jimmy would tuck the cat's head back into the bag, <laughs> the cat in return would poke his head back out. <laughs> so Jimmy could never really keep the cat's head in the bag and the effort was hilarious. <laughs> Fane loved to tell that story because she thought it was the funniest thing. It is rather funny when you come to think of it. Then another story was about Otis Redding. Yeah, yeah, Otis Redding. Well, Fane and Jimmy were staying in a room above the Cecil Hotel in Harlem, around 118th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. The Cecil Hotel was adjacent to Minton's Playhouse, a famous jazz club in Harlem, once frequented by jazz musicians such as Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, and Thelonious Monk. You know, cats like that. Well, it turned out that a party or something was going on in one of the suites at the Cecil Hotel. It was more than likely after Otis Redding and a few of those, you know, soul cats, you know, soul singers who were in town partying after a gig at the Apollo Theater. The story goes that after a night of partying and drinking, Otis closes the hotel door and passes out on one of the beds. Well, Somehow, Fane had stumbled upon the room and saw Otis lying in the bed, and she just was sleepy, and there was no other beds around, so she laid down and went to sleep as well. So by this time, they both were in the bed asleep. Now, Jimmy, looking for Fane, and couldn't find her, just looking everywhere. Jimmy finally stumbled upon the room and sees Fane and Otis Red and lying down in the same bed. Now, Jimmy gets furious. And he begins to yell at the top of his lungs, get out of that bed with Otis Redding. Now at that time, same time, Fane is saying, nothing ever went down. Nothing was going on between her and Otis. Jimmy didn't believe her. And Otis just sitting on the side of the bed trying to figure out what was going on. According to Fane, <laughs> that's a true story about a party at the Cecil Hotel. You know, what I always thought was peculiar was that she swore she and Jimmy was not an item, not together as boyfriend and girlfriend. She would say, Jimmy wasn't my boyfriend. I don't know why people would say that. <laughs> he was just a friend, a lovable buddy. I had many men friends, and he was just one of them. <laughs> she was a great lady, and I enjoyed, enjoyed talking to her for nearly 12 years. And most times, you know, it wasn't about Jimmy. It was more about Georgia, her hometown, and also my hometown, or just life or her friendships with Sly Stone and Etta James and her singing career. Mm -hmm. The Jimmy and Fane experience was over. Well, at least for now, and at least the Harlem version. And although Jimmy moved on down to Greenwich Village and began digging the music scene there, he would always somehow still remain close to fame. His playing style began to change once he hit the village scene because the more free he was and not as constricted to a group that had an iron fist on him, he was free to play and express himself any way he wanted he had started his own group, 
He once said about the evolution of his playing style, he says, well, you know, like sometimes I rub up against the uh, amplifier and then, then, you know, sometimes I sit on it. Sometimes I just jump on the guitar, you know. <laughs> I, I got a gadget called the, the, the wah wah pedal, you know, you, you just press it with your feet and it, it goes then sometimes I grind the strings up against the frets. The more it grinds, the more it winds. Sometimes I play with my teeth, you know, just for a moment. You can hardly notice it, it's so fast. Or I'll be playing with my elbow for a moment. I can't remember all the things I do. <laughs> you know? Once I was playing away and there was a short circuit and the guitar went up in flames, flames, flames. <laughs> What's happening here, I said. <laughs> it went pretty well so far. About three other times after that, I, I sprayed lighter fluid on it and then, and then, and then stamped out the burning pieces. <laughs> Well, while playing around the village as Jimmy James and the Blue Flames, Jimmy began to book gigs at the Cafe Wa, playing his usual rotation of R&B and blues songs. Jimmy hadn't quite written any popular songs we may know. Therefore, we had not been introduced to his soon-to-come magnetic, magical sounds. The influences of the day were still circling through his brain. Groups like James Brown and the Famous Flames. Ike and Tina Turner, the Isley Brothers, and the Motown sound was still on heavy rotation and all around. To Jimmy's credit, he had backed up most of those groups. And in fact, it wasn't until I heard after attending a great James Brown show that James Brown mentioned that Jimmy was once in his band as a sideman that I remembered, ah, one of the musicians that Jimmy, James Brown, would pick up throughout each city he would play. However, Jimmy slowly beginning to morph into his own sound, slowly but surely. And as much as the current popular sounds were a part of his current playlist, he began listening and being influenced more by Dylan, Eric Clapton, and yet still lending his ear to the sounds and chords of Elmore James and B.B. King and Muddy Waters. Jimmy began to experiment more with the showmanship of presenting his music and image. T-Bone Walker, the blues guitarist, came to mind when understanding Jimmy's showmanship at that time. T-Bone used to play the guitar behind the back of his head while falling into a full split on the floor while playing with his teeth. A technique he may have seen from talented unknown bluesmen in some chitlin circuit bar and grill down south. However, no matter where Jimmy had gotten it from, he began to combine it all together. And behind his back, behind his head, playing with his teeth, playing and getting sounds by rubbing his elbow across the guitar strings. Planting continuously while falling to his knees, rolling onto his back, circling in a windmill motion while playing between his legs and ultimately closing of the show's routine. He began doing this just before his performance at Monterey and discontinued it shortly after. And as I remember Jimmy's showmanship, I must reflect back to Jimmy's tour with Little Richard, the ultimate showman. You see, up until that time, Jimmy would dress and present himself as most musicians, showmen's would do during the era. Usually they wore a tuxedo or a dark suit, which was not distracting in the background behind the more flamboyant artists like uh, Little Richard, who was allowed to stand out in an array of colors. Touring with Little Richard was another opportunity for Jimmy to travel and keep a little money in his pocket for spending essentials. Even though sometimes it would be weeks before members of the band would get paid, if anything at all. Uh, being on the road didn't allow many musicians to have a love life unless their women would travel from town to town with them. And Jimmy would sometimes miss the bus because he'd stay too long with the woman he met in a certain town while on tour. Hey. <laughs> Linda Keith and Chaz Chandler.
Click, clang, what a bang, what a bang, what a bang. Jimmy finds himself in the heart of the village playing with the blue flames. And sometimes as a single artist and sometimes just making new friends, the Harlem days were left behind and wondering how Fane and the twins, brother Albert and Alan, were doing. Yet Jimmy walks on down those lonely streets of MacDougal and 8th Street and West 4th Street through Washington Square and in and out of the groovy digs like the Purple Onion Club and the Folk City where Bob Dylan, one may say, was discovered. Linda Keith was a young woman of 20 years of age that Jimmy had met at Undine's Club in New York City on East 59th Street. Linda was Caucasian from a wealthy family, sophisticated, chic, always well put together and classy. She was a model on the New York and international scene. She knew the members of rock royalty of that time, like the Rolling Stones. She knew members of the Animals and even the Beatles. She was a British woman living in America who had the means to travel and see these groups. It was 1966 in New York City, and New York was slowly coming out of the British invasion. The mod scene, the Twiggy era, post-JFK and Malcolm X assassination, and slowly coming into this hippie psychedelic scene. It was Linda Keith who invited the Stones to hear Jimmy play at Undines. Now the Stones were in town playing a gig at Forest Hill Stadium and took on Linda's invite to see this guy that she raved about and for the life of her could not believe that he had not been discovered. Well, after the first gig, most of the Stones thought they had seen something special. Charlie Watts and Bill Wyman gave it the thumbs up. Keith Richards and Mick were like, okay, he's special. But it was Brian Jones who was blown away by Hendrix. It was the summer of 1966 in early July, and the animals were in town for a July 4th gig. Linda saw bass player Chaz Chandler at Club Undines and began to rave about Jimmy and insisted that he should go and see him. So Linda and Chaz caught Jimmy at Cafe Wa on Madugal Street in the village. This time, Chaz was completely at a loss for words. How can this most talented cat be playing in a dingy dungeon like the Cafe War and not have been discovered? Chaz would often admit that he himself was a marginal musician at best. But here's Jimmy, exceptionally talented with a funky blues sound, many gimmicks and showmanship to match yet undiscovered. Jimmy's set that night was like a rolling stone, midnight hour, Land of a Thousand Dances, and one of Chaz's favorites, Hey Joe. Chaz knew he wanted in some way to connect with Jimmy and thought not yet. Though not yet he was a manager, he was certainly heading in that direction. But first he had to finish his tour with the animals and make his way back to New York. But Jimmy, in the meantime, would continue to play gigs around the village, rubbing elbows with the likes of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Arlo Guthrie, Richie Havens, Mississippi John Hurt, and of course, Bob Dylan, who Hendrix thought was the greatest. By this time, what a rhyme. Jimi Hendrix struck up a friendship with a local musician, John Hammond Jr., who was the son of John Hammond Sr., the legendary producer at Columbia, Columbia Records. The Sr. Hammond name was synonymous with the likes of Billy Holiday and, and Robert Johnson and the legendary blues guitarist. Jimmy and John formed a group called the Screaming Nighthawks and began to play the Cafe Agogo in New York City. And after a few months, Chaz was back in town to conclude his tour with the animals in Central Park. Chaz had talk to the animal's manager, Mike Jeffrey, about managing Jimmy. So Chaz took Mike to the Cafe of Go-Go to see Jimmy, and from there, they were both on the same page. Chaz and Jeffrey was convinced that Jimmy was the man and that he was unsigned. Well, at least they thought so. And after Jimmy gave Chaz a final push on the possibility of signing him, it was a deal. Chaz and Mike Jeffrey they were on the same page. <laughs> they wanted to be in on it. 
Now, however, Jimmy had just one burning desire that if he go to England, that he would meet Eric Clapton. As realizing that all of his music contacts were in England, the only way this deal was to work was to take Jimmy to London. Jimmy had great respect for one of the musicians in his band and the Blue Flames and, and wondered if uh, Randy California, that 15 year old slide guitarist could also make the trek to London so Jimmy could have you know someone whom he played with and knew he had a cool vibe with. But based on Randy's age, uh, youth still in high school, Chaz and Jeffrey decided that that wouldn't be a good idea. So now Jimmy was indeed faced with a decision that would change the trajectory of his life forever. He had had a connection to the manager and musician who were part of one of the most successful groups in the world at that time, the Animals. Here's Jimmy who barely had a working guitar, making maybe $3 a night, sleeping here and there and everywhere and a few pair of slacks, maybe a black shirt and one trench coat to his name. He must have been wondered if he was sailing on the prayers of his great grandmother, Zenora Hendricks, who was a renowned and well-respected evangelist in Vancouver and the general Northwestern Canada vicinity, or maybe that and his church going aunt, Freddie May's prayers were beginning to make for Jimmy's success. You see, what I'm trying to say is maybe, just maybe, those prayers were beginning to work for the benefit and lessons in his life. For the territory that Jimmy was now embarking upon, he would surely need prayer and lots of it. He would surely need the favor of the Lord that maketh one rich and adds no sorrow to it. For the doors that Jimmy wants to open are sealed with thousands on the outside, willing to sell their soul and enter into a dungeon of hell. But maybe with the blessings of the Lord, one could enter in and pass through unscathed. Maybe just maybe it's possible for surely your gift will make room for you. And Jimmy surely had a most perfect gift. He was a gifted musical entity, entering a genius status, but boy, did he work at it. It was time to enter England, someplace he had never been before, but first the passport. He needed, at age 23, a passport. And Jimi Hendrix board a Pan Am airplane first class shortly after midnight on September the 23rd and arrived in London's Heathrow Airport on September the 24th, 1966. It was a Saturday morning. Jimmy carried a guitar case and a small bag. Chad had arranged for them to stop by Zoot Money, a British rocker and big band leader who had arranged a jam session with Jimmy's arrival. Zoot placed a Fender Telecaster guitar in Jimmy's hand, and upon arrival, they immediately began to jam. As in, and Jimmy later checked into the Hyde Park Tower, and later that night would go to a nearby club, the Scotch of St. James, to listen to some music. Have a few, you know, social drinks and appetizers as Jimmy is introduced to the hipsters of London society. Kathy Etchingham, a red-haired, green-eyed London native lived upstairs in Zoot Money's home. She was invited to sit in with the crew of friends and guests by Zoot Money's wife, Ronnie, and with her eye on Jimmy and Jimmy's eye on her, well, the party began. Then the Keith's, Jimmy's main squeeze from New York would soon show up, but Jimmy would leave with Kathy because since they were now in London and Linda was actually Keith Richards' girlfriend of the Stones, well, Jimmy felt that was an inappropriate, inappropriate thing to do. And Jimmy left the club with Kathy and ultimately went up to his room where they would spend the night together. However, a surprise attack in his sleep that night. Linda showed up in the hotel room, breaks in and charged for the guitar she had brought for Jimmy while living in New York. So having just arrived in London, Jimmy has a room, 
a girl, but no guitar. And that's how the first few days in London began. It's got to be uphill from here. was to build a band around this extraordinary musician. Finally, Jimmy began to feel he had room to stretch and really be creative. Not just surviving or playing for meals and a bed, but now maybe writing some of his own songs instead of just playing cover tunes or popular bands. The most important thing was now was getting his own band together with his own unique sound on the swinging London scene. Chaz Chandler and, and Lotta, his lady at the time, took Jimmy in and gave him his first residence on Berkeley Street in London. They would sit up some nights and powwow to the early morning, exchanging rips and deciding what type of group to build up around Jimmy. Finally, they were dis decided and a notice was sent out for a drummer and a bass guitarist. The notice officially was for the animals who were replacing musicians for their upcoming tour. Mitch Mitchell, once a child actor on British television, had played with some of England's most noted R&B groups and was an accomplished drummer who had a driving jazz beat to his drumming. Formerly with Georgia Flame and the Blue Flames, Mitch came in with a cooperative confidence manner and was a perfect compliment to Jimmy's playing. Noah Redding showed up expecting to try out as a guitar player. And he encounters Jimmy, a tall, lean, lanky African-American who was standing around in dark clothing in what looked like a London fog trench coat. After jamming for a few tunes, it felt like he could be a likely fit for the new band. And after the session, Noor was invited out to an English pub where he was indeed told that he would be the bass player for the newly formed group. Mitch was completely in, and Noel was later added, and the Jimi Hendrix experience was formed. It was Chaz who was changing the name of the spelling of Jimmy's name, Chaz Chandler, his manager. He had this idea that Jimmy would spell his name J-I-M-A-I, -I, not J-I-M-M-Y. Nonetheless, the Jimi Hendrix experience was formed. The following day, Jimi Hendrix's experience was off to Paris, France to join the Johnny Holiday tour. Johnny Holiday was known as the European Elvis Presley. Now, if you ask me, Chaz and Mike Jeffrey didn't quite know how to market the band. However, they needed to get the band out to audience to get some exposure and build an audience. It was no doubt in Chaz and Jeffrey's mind that it would only be a matter of time they played to a sold-out house at the Olympia with a set that included Killing Floor, Wild Thing, and Hey Joe, all rather familiar cover tunes. And soon after the gig, it was off to D-Lane Studio to record Hey Joe. Jimmy liked the original Tim Rose tune and used the same musical arrangement on their recording. After showing Noah the bass line for Hey Joe, Jimmy was set. The band was fired up and ready to record their first record together. In the studio, the band was backed with vocals by the Breakaways, uh, a female vocal group that consisted of Gloria George and Barbara Moore and Margaret Stetter. One would always have to listen closely to Hey Joe to hear the beautiful haunting vocals supplied by the women that adds a touch of the woman who betrays a man and stepping out on him for another man. Such an all too familiar saga and never ending story, whether the hurt is inflicted by a man to a woman or whether in this case, a woman's betrayal of the man who thought the woman was his and his alone. Truly, Jimmy could relate having often not enough money and maybe it all, all he could give was his affection to the woman, but it wasn't enough, so she run out. In most relationships, it's usually expected of the man to run around, but when the woman does it, it's a kick in the gut. It's the ultimate act of betrayal. 
a pull at a man's manhood. And those vocals in the background seem to say, hey, Joe, no, Joe, don't do it, Joe. Don't do it, Joe. The lyrics originally written by Tim Rose are, hey, Joe, where are you going with that gun in your hand? I'm going down to shoot my old lady. You know, I call her messing around with another man. Yeah, and that ain't too cool. Jimmy would have never, well, I don't know. I always say Jimmy would have never written a song about killing a woman, but it was a blues song. And blues is about pain and overcoming pain. So I don't know. But in this case, Tim Rose wrote the song Jimmy liked the song, and he recorded it. Jimmy, I tell you, even if it was betrayal, still, I couldn't say for sure that he would. Jimmy knew the story all too well of a broken heart and lost love, of a man and woman lying on the killing floor of separation and pain. It's an age-old story, like the consequences of Adam leaving Eve, if only for a few minutes, or Frankie catching Johnny, and shooting him, or the rage that mounts up in Harold Loomis from August Wilson's Joe Turner's Come and Gone, who is returning home to find his wife has left. Harold Loomis was abducted by Joe Turner, who made it a daily chore to capture men who went out to make a decent day's wage, and most times not returning, or in Loomis' case, not returning until seven years after. Tim Rose goes on to, to write, Yes, I did. I shot her. You know, I call her messing around with another man. And that ain't no cool cool. I'm going way down south, way down to Mexico way. I'm going way down south, way down so I can be free. Ain't nobody going to find me. Ain't no hangman's going to. He ain't going to put a rope around me. You better believe that now, yeah. Yet the tragedy of a crime of passion will always end in an unforgivable sin by the authority of the law. But from God's heart is most forgivable. A few finishing touches on Hey Joe, this time at Pie Studio in London. And the tune was in the can. I've heard a few renditions of Hey Joe by Tim Rose, who sang the original, and indeed is a passionate rendition of an old Appalachian song that reflects a crime of passion from a severely broken heart. Yet Jimmy chooses the song for his ability and desire to tell the story and the blues tradition that's innately embedded in his spirit. And it's a collaborative tune between him and his fellow musicians and that he doesn't choose the song to stand out as a guitarist, but as a shared explanation or exploration of his, this haunting tale with Noah holding down the steady bass and Mitch surrounding the sound with a steady jazz pace. Syncopated rhythm is truly a trio recording by the Jimi Hendrix experience with the stunning vocals of the three women known as the Breakaways. And so, hey, Joe, was released to the airways on December the 16th, 1966. And now with the band's first recorded song, the band was set to hit the club scenes in London. There was the Upper Cup Club, Hillside Social Club, the Marquee Club, the Seven and a Half Club, the Beachcomber Club, Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club and the Bag of Nails Club where Jimmy would write Purple Haze while backstage preparing to go on. And so the Jimi Hendrix experience was off and running from club to club. And the toast of London's music scene gathering to hear the band, which featured this new exciting guitarist from the States. Gathered in those clubs were Paul McCartney and John Lennon and Eric Clapton, who was one of the first to play with Jimmy on his arrival in London. And of course, there was Linda Keith, Spencer Davis, Ron Wood, Keith Richards, Lulu of To Serve of Love fame, Mick Jagger, and even his girl at the time, Marianne Faithful, who Jimmy began to put some moves on. Now he'd taken Keith Richards' girl, Linda, and now Marianne, 
hey, Jimmy, that ain't right. With the traditional push from managers Jazz and Jeffrey, Hey Joe had climbed to number four. The band was slowly becoming the toast of the town. And then there was the press party at the Upper Cup Club, where Jimmy would write his biggest hit, Purple Haze. This time, Jimmy's guitar was featured as a main attraction, up front, vivid, funky, and loud. Jimmy was suddenly being recognized as a rock guitarist, which was interesting considering his first hit was Hey Joe, a blues tune which featured him as a blues musician. This should be interesting. Now, now where is this going? Purple Haze. Purple Haze was originally about a dream Jimmy had at one time or the night before the press release and gig at the Uppercut Club. It was a dream about Jimmy walking underwater and seeing all kinds of groovy fish of multicolors and other sea creatures. In fact, the original lyrics were Purple Haze, Jesus Saves. Yes, Purple Haze, Jesus Saves. Jesus Saves, Purple Haze. Beyond insane, is it pleasure or is it pain? Down on the ceiling, looking up at the bed, see my body painted blue and red. I see fetus unborn pointing at the time, rushing through space. My hair's blowing in their minds through the haze. I see 1,000 crosses, but Jimmy's management didn't agree with that. No, no, no. They said, no, no, you can't be mentioning Jesus and 1,000 crosses. That wouldn't go. That wouldn't sell. As much as he wanted Purple Haze to go in some sort of divine direction and wanted it to have a significant meaning, the powers that be wouldn't accept or want that. Jimmy now began to imagine Purple Haze and the divine driven blue water that transcends because of the beams from the sun on the ocean waters and now groovy. That imagery would be with some cool sounds and some sort of intergalactic feeling. The song was originally about five or more minutes long, but Chaz would say, no chap, that will not work. We need a pop rock tune on the three minutes long. And let's forget about walking underwater, Jimmy. So Jimmy created an imagery that appears in the mind that goes, purple haze all in my veins. Lately things just don't seem the same. Acting funny, but I don't know why. Excuse me while I kiss the sky. The song now becomes a far out anthem for the hippie generation on a far out trip induced by hallucinating substance that would blow the minds. The Beatles would call it Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And Jimmy would say it wasn't about that at all. So off now to a new recording studio called Olympia in London. Waiting there almost as if expecting their arrival was a young blonde Canadian chap named Eddie Kramer. And he had just started working at Olympia Studio. And he was a creative, excited, willing to work long enough to get the sound right. Jimmy and Eddie would create sound effects that would paint the canvas of the sky a purple, orange, green, and blue hue, a yellow blaze and ocean sounds, rain and wind blowing, the sounds of the wind and the clouds taking flight. And being that Jimmy was once a paratrooper, jumping from planes and hearing the many blazing splendid sounds of soundscapes of the wind, clouds, and sky flowing from one earlobe to the other. Yes, Eddie Kramer was a yes, a yes, a yes to create Jimmy's new intergalactic orbits spaceships landing sounds that seem to flow from Chaz Chandler's library at the home of the vivid advanced collection of science fiction novels. There were many Isaac Asinoff novels on the bookshelf of Chaz Berkeley Street flat. Acting funny, but I don't know why. Excuse me while I kiss the sky. Purple Haze was an introduction to the surging emerging psychedelic era 
like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. It described the ultimate trip of being so high you can touch the sky. It was not what Jimmy originally intended, but was what the management wanted. So after Purple Haze was in the can, a tour was just beginning with the Walker Brothers and Ingebert Humperdinck as headliners, and it also featured Cat Stevens and the Jimi Hendrix Experience, three rather mellow pop groups and the loud, raunchy, but bluesy experience. After the tour and the emerging hit status of Purple Haze, which was number three out of the top 10 in London, Jimmy was now being recognized as the number one male sex symbol in London. He was sought after to give a quote to the Sunday Mirror about his stage presence and guitar as a sort of phallic symbol in his act. Jimmy, however, brushed that off by quoting, and you know, I, <laughs> you know, I, I think act is, is maybe the wrong word. I play and move as I feel. Uh, it's not an act. Perhaps it's, uh, you know, perhaps it's sexy, but <laughs> what music with a big beat isn't? After two hits on the charts, two tours throughout Europe, and more club dates, Jimmy began to change up his wardrobe to be a little in touch with the times, the hippie flower generation. So with a little more money, Jimmy began to add more colorful bell-bottom pants and flowers and paisley shirts and vests and a bold black fedora. One would say his American Indian side of this obvious African-American man was meshing together and reflected in his dress. Jimmy would find his way to Carnaby Street, the sort of Greenwich Village of London Jimmy found an old English military jacket at the thrift shop called Lord Kishner's Valet. The jacket was full of adorned with gold braidings on the sleeves and collars, along with golden military buttons with a touch of fur sewn in the upper chest area of the jacket. There Jimmy stood in all his royalty, in command and in demand, and well equipped to step into his surging popularity. He was slowly but surely being crowned the king of the hill with Kit Lambert managing the Who and Brian Epstein managing the Beatles and Mike Jeffrey managing the animals. Chaz Chandler by now knew he must stay ahead of the curve. The summer of 1967 was known as the summer of love. The Monterey Pop Festa was being planned and Jeffrey and Chaz knew that would be the place to be. The festival was to be held at the Monterey Fairgrounds. The Monterey stage was also host to a major jazz festival during the spring, as well as folk pop music and soul music. The festival consisted of, a, uh, of groovy people, ongoing music and exhibit, exhibit boots throughout the fairground. Candace Bergen, the American actress was there. Bill Graham, Lou Atla, Brian Jones and Andy Warhol's favorite, Nico, was also there. And with a lineup that included some of the hottest acts of that summer, like Janis Joplin and Otis Redding and Simon and Garfunkel and the Grateful Dead and Booker T and the MGs and Hugh Masekela and the Who, just to name a few. And the festival board of directors included Paul Simon, Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, Brian Jones, Donovan, Michelle and John Phillips, Johnny Rivers, and Smokey Robinson. It was truly the place to be, and with a highly praised recommendation by Paul McCartney, the Jimi Hendrix experience was added to the list of performers. <laughs> So arriving in Monterey, California, Jimmy would take in a day with a blonde on his arms. He would later walk the fairgrounds viewing the many boots of electric local and jewelry boots and goods and the groovy people of the Monterey fairgrounds. He and Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones reuniting from their buddy days in swinging London. Brian, who had been chosen to introduce Jimmy, was recognized by many as they walked around. Nobody seemed to know who Jimi Hendrix was. So the night finally arrives at the Monterey Pop Festival where Jimi and the experience were to go on. 
And there's this ongoing story about who would go on first. It was said, as a matter of fact, <laughs> Pete Townsend would say, well, we, we were waiting backstage. And I said, well, we're not going to follow you on. And Jimmy was saying, well, we're, we're not going to follow you on. And we went back and forth until Jimmy says, if we're going to follow you on, we're going to pull out all the stops. And he gets up in a chair and he stands on the seat of the chair and he began to play this astounding music. But who goes on to play their usual set and our popular well-awaited treat for the Monterey crowd? And at the end of their set, they would begin to destroy their instruments. Keith Moon would kick over and smash his drums. Keith Townsend would destroy his guitar and the band walked off. In the Jimi Hendrix experience would walk on, plugging their guitars. <laughs> By this time in his career, they would have the best setup, which consisted of a sun cabinet with a JBL D-130 in the bottom. They had an L-E-100-S driver horn on the top, blended with a Marshall 100 watch speaker stack. Foot pedals consisting of a crybaby pedal and a fuzz face pedal with the knobs on Jimmy's sunburst hand-painted Fender Stratocaster set to 10, the highest range of sound possible. The experience starts the set with, I should have quit you long time ago by Howlin' Wolf. Wolf. Jimmy steps out in full regalia. He wore a, a, a bright striped orange ruffle shirt, Afghan vest, red pants, colorful headbands, and feather boa. He steps out with a riveting rendition of Killing Floor, playing five times as fast as the original with a rev up introduction on the guitar. Then an explosion, a full thrust into the song with Jimmy going into a dance while playing the guitar mostly with one hand. Then into the opening verse, I should have quit you long time ago, yeah. I should have quit your pretty baby long time ago. what I say? I should have quit you and went on down to Mexico if I had followed my last mind. Yeah, if I had followed pretty baby, my last mind, I should have been gone <laughs> since by supper time. And once again, a signature blues with the lament of a man losing his love for a woman and his regret of not leaving before she left. So he's on the killing floor of pain, of lost love, of love lost. The entire set was riveting, electric with the eyes of the audience, ultra focused on his very move. He flows to the set that included Rock Me Baby, The Wind Cries Mary, Foxy Lady, Hey Joe in Purple Haze, he's playing with his teeth, he's playing behind his head, he's playing between his legs, he's playing behind his back with his elbow, he's playing and getting sounds while rubbing the guitar against the microphone stand. And as he promised Pete Townsend, if I follow you, I'm pulling all the stops. And at the end of the set, he goes into Wild Thing. Wild Thing! Wild thing, I uh, think I love you. He starts by getting a reverb sound by just using the whammy bar and turning the guitar horizontally and getting a kind of space sound and astral sound. It's like a rocket taking off, howling wind sound. He warns the audience to watch out for your ears, watch out for your ears. Then he goes into the first chorus of Wild Thing. It's the best you've ever played the song. He's in his own now, and in fact, the entire band has zoned out with Mitch on drums, keeping a steady pace. Noel, in the meantime, is thumping the guitar, holding down the bass. Noel is even playing behind his head. The crowd is in a frenzy with the audience running up and down the aisles. I mean, they'd never seen anything like this. And Jimmy's, the consummate showman, came to turn it out. And true to how he started Wild Thing saying, now, I'd like to sacrifice something I really love. And as a finale, he places the guitar down, which is still vibrating from being played to a frenzy. 
And after he's down with a backwards flip while still playing, he places the guitar down and begins to go into some sacrificial worshiping moment. He then pulls out a can of lighter fluid conveniently, passes it. Somebody passed it to him, his, his, his road manager, Eric Barrett. He now begins to cover the guitar with lighter fluid and it bursts into flames. Audience is now wondering what is going on? Uh, where's he going from here? Uh, they're turning towards each other like, 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 is someone or isn't somebody going to put this fire out? Jimmy at this time picks up the guitar and begins to smash the guitar into the stage floor and to bits and pieces. He then picks up the guitar pieces and throws parts of it into the audience. He then picks up the neck of the guitar and throws that into the audience. Then he walks off stage. Backstage now turned into an overflow of congratulations. And there's no doubt that this was the hottest moment at the Monterey Pop Festival. Hugh Masekela is running up to Jimmy and saying, man, hey, man, you, you blew their minds, man. You blew them, blew them away. Mitch and Noel are being congratulated as well because as a unit, they were on fire as a performing band. Surely Jimmy could not have done it alone. It's at this moment that the Jimi Hendrix experience graduated from rumor to legend. This was Jimmy's first big gig back in the States after his arrival in Europe, and it was a smash hit. It was a summer of love, a dreamlike possibility that everyone could live as one and in one accord, a summer of turning away from the discord of race relations and assassinations like those of John F. Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King. But soon in 1968, Malcolm X, and soon in 1968, others would follow like Dr. King and Robert F. Kennedy. And even during that time in 67, the Vietnam War was in full swing. It was a rebellion of youth to find themselves spiritually, individually, emotionally, and politically. It was the possibility of reaching across the color line to be of one accord and truly live as brothers and sisters through peace and love. So it was a thrust, a certain burst of thousands moving across the country to San Francisco and beginning to make that notion of peace and love a reality. From Monterey, it was an immediate move to Haight-Asbury to where an entire culture grew. It seemed Jimi Hendrix was at the helm of it, along with Janis Joplin and the Grateful Dead and Steppenwolf and the Jefferson Airplane and the Chamber Brothers, the Doors and many others. Jimmy's management immediately began to book the tour with the Monkees, although a very popular group. The Monkees fan base consisted of 13 and 14 year olds that couldn't digest sitting through Wild Thing with a flaming guitar so it didn't draw the crowd that would take in Jimi Hendrix. Yet for all Jimi Hendrix had inspired to become, he had arrived as the most sought after new audience, a new artist on the international scene. And after in America, for the first time since he left, this was his coming out party. No more pawning his guitar just for a meal. No more playing in the background. No more of an afterthought when guitarists were mentioned as trailblazers or no thought at all. The Jimi Hendrix Experience was now the highest paid performing band in the world. At times ahead of the Beatles or at times ahead of the Stones and the Cream. This plan to make him the next big thing had worked. Jimmy was now mentioned or appearing in every current magazines, was one of the first to appear on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Tours were booked, taking the Jimi Hendrix experience to mostly every major city in the world, but surely in the USA. From Roanoke to Rome, from Canton to Cleveland, from Denmark to Detroit, from Philadelphia to Paris. You know, I always thought of Jimmy as this shy, gifted Seattle boy who desired and aspired for greatness, who in essence was just a man with a guitar. They created this image and the image became larger than the man. 
So he had to wake up every day and every morning and be Jimi Hendrix. And he accepted that image and ran with it. And he had the talent to back it up. He didn't read music and he played mostly left hand. So he would take a right hand guitar and turn it upside down and play. His music progressed from psychedelic rock and blues and the album, Are You Experienced? to imaginary science fiction and fairy tales and love songs and acts as bold as love to futuristic jazz and bold songs of the love of women and walking on the water as a voodoo child and electric lady land to funky soul and coming together as people as he stood on his pulpit of peace and social change and the album, a band of gypsies. And that was it. Four albums and three and a half years of popular recording as a front man. And then it was all over. A three and a half year recording career. Not to be compared to those of a 40 year career or being creative and improving their gifts of musicianship and songwriting. He could play lead, rhythm and bass guitar, keyboards and drums, all from inspiration a deeply felt spiritual gift. The albums released after his physical presence on Earth was Cry of Love and Rainbow Bridge. And it expressed where he was headed in his music. There were more spiritual, social and political uplifting message. And straight ahead, he goes, we got to tell the children the truth. They don't need a whole lot of lies. Because one of these days, uh, they'll be running things. So when you give them love, you better give it twice. Keep on straight ahead. In Earth Blues, he was right. Well, you know, there's got to be some changes. Got to be a whole lot of rearranging. You better hope love is the answer. Lord, you better hope it comes before the summer. Straight ahead. Straight ahead straight ahead and during the last two years of jimmy career his music was going into a direction known as sky church music he wanted to begin to present a more positive image to his music he'd say you know other bands would play loud and they have this you know shrill sound uh, but we want our music to go into the hearts and soul of the person to 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 wake them up because there are so many sleeping people nowadays he began to want to make his music more available to the black community. Shortly after his appearance at Woodstock, he agreed to play the Harlem 135th Street Festival just a few weeks after the Summer of Soul. Yes, the 135th Street Festival where he'd play before a predominantly black crowd, finally bringing the music back home to Harlem Shortly before the Woodstock gig, Jimmy would meet with jazz trumpeter Miles Davis to discuss a possible collaboration. However, management, mostly on Jimmy's end, could not agree on the collaboration, and Jimmy would go on to play Woodstock, and Miles would go on to play Bitches Brew. Music and his ideas about where his music or the direction of his music began to change, hearing the voice of God speaking to him. The lyrics of his songs were beginning to go more towards the divine sensation of getting in touch with one's soul. There was the symbolic image of an entity most notably felt as an angel guiding and protecting his footsteps in the song Angel. Jimmy writes, angel came down from heaven yesterday. She came just long enough to rescue me. And she told me a story yesterday about the sweet love between the moon and the deep blue sea. And then she spread her wings high over me. And she said, don't worry, I'm coming back tomorrow. Or when he writes in the song, Little Wing, he says, well, she's walking. Through the clouds with a circus smile that's running wild. 
butterflies and zebras and moonbeams and fairy tales. That's all she ever thinks about. She's riding with the wind. It was this feeling as if he expected this angel, an angel to come and take him away to a better place. In the song, Hey Baby, he writes, Hey, baby, where are you coming from? Well, she looked at me and smiled and looked into space and said, I'm coming from the land of a new rising sun. And I say, hey, baby, where are you trying to go to? And she said, I'm going to spread, spread around a piece of mine and a whole lot of love to you and you. Would you like to come along? Um, he felt he had a message to give to all people of all races and cultures. So no longer were the old standards in the beginning of the playlist like Purple Haze and Foxy Lady and Fire and All Alone the Watchtower and Hey Joe. But now among the playlists were songs like Message of Love, Power of Love, Angel, Hey Baby, Little Wing, and In From the Storm. And as much and as often as he could see the divine light through an angel by his side, he also felt like the old bluesman, Robert Johnson, who would say, I got to keep on moving, keep on grooving. Blues falling down like hell, blues falling down like hell, blues falling down like hell, blues falling down like hell. I got to keep on moving. Hell hounds on my trail, hell hounds on my trail, hell hounds on my trail, hell hounds on my trail. He was on top of the world, but could feel his kingdom crumbling down, overworked, underpaid, because he was receiving a mere half to a third of what he was actually earning or bringing in. Eventually, Noah Redding would leave the band and was replaced by Jimmy's old pal, Billy Cox. And eventually, the lineup would consist of three African-American musicians, Jimmy, Billy Cox, and Buddy Miles, to form Jimmy's new group, the Band of Gypsies. The lineup would then eventually change as Jimmy was continually, continually finding or exploring with a new sound. At Woodstock, the lineup would consist of Billy Cox on bass, Larry Lee on rhythm guitar, Jumas and Sorten, and Jerry Velez on congas. I was first introduced to Jimmy through the band of Gypsies. That's where I started. And then I went back to Are You Experience? As the band of Gypsies, Fillmore East Concert would usher in the new decade of the 1970s, Billy Cox would now be the new bass player. However, yet again, Mitch Mitchell had returned and remained on drums, and the requests would come in consistently from concert halls and fans around the world. They wanted to hear the Jimi Hendrix sound of the experience, Gypsies, Suns and Rainbows, and the band of Gypsies all rolled up into one. But it all ended on a quiet Friday morning at the Samarkand Hotel in Lansdowne Crescent, Notting Hill Gate, in a cold, lonely room with no no one present, Monica Daneman, a woman he'd met two years prior. She was a former ice skating champion from Germany whose father owned a pharmaceutical company. And as the death certificate would indicate, his death was due to inhalation of vomit, due to barbiturate intoxication, insufficient evidence of circumstances, open verdict, dated and signed September 18, 1970. His body was flown back to Seattle and the funeral was held on October the 1st. In attendance was his family, including his father, Al, brother Leon, Aunt Freddie Mae and other close relatives, bandmates, Mitch Mitchell, Noah Redding and Buddy Miles were all in attendance as well as fellow musicians, Miles Davis, Johnny Winters, 
Devin Wilson, who would fondly refer to as Dolly Dagger, his foxy lady. When his body was removed from the Samarkand Hotel, a last poem was found on the nightstand near the bed. It read, story of life, story of Jesus, so easy to explain. After they crucified him, a woman, she claimed his name. Story of Jesus, the whole Bible knows. When all across the desert and in the middle, he found the rose. There should be no questions. There should be no lies. He was married ever happily ever. All the tears we cry. No use in arguing all the use to the man that moans. When each man falls in battle, his soul it has to roam. Angels of heaven flying saucers to some made Easter Sunday the name of the new rising sun. The story is written by so many people who dared to lay down the truth, by so many people who cared, carried the cross of Jesus and beyond. We will guide the light this time with the woman in our arms. We as men can't explain the reason why the woman's always mentioned at the moment that we die. All we know is God is by our side. And he says the words, so easy yet so hard. I wish not to be alone, so I must respect my other heart. Oh, the story of Jesus is the story of you and me. No use in feeling lonely. I am searching like you to be free. The story of life is quicker than the wink of an eye. The story of love is hello and goodbye until we meet again. And thank you. And this is the end. This is an actor's journey through the life legend and divine lineage of Jimi Hendrix. And please stay tuned for this post-show talk with Rosalie Brooks and Jimmy Blue and Mike Jones and Juma Sultan. An incredible lineup of those who have uh, been inspired by Jimmy's music and, and was there with Jimmy on stage as well. We'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mona Scott and Sean Scott of the Black Repertory Theater in Berkeley, California, for the opportunity to present this work, uh, still a work in progress and still an actor's journey of the Jimi Hendrix story. So stay once again for our talk back post-show discussion as we go directly into that. And we'd like to thank Rome Neal for his direction. Thank you, thank you so very much, Jerome, for your wonderful love for Jimmy Hendrix and to be a part of uh, being a part of this this um, black theater black theater uh, that week that we have right. This is black theater week. Yes. Um, right. So uh, I just got this in. It was supposed to be a surprise, but it came in, and I had to read it to you because there's no one to read it to for me. Uh, and it goes like this. The Honorable Barbara Lee, 13th Congressional District of California, Certificate of Special Congressional Recognition presented to Jerome Preston Bates and Rome Neal in recognition of your work with the Black Repertory Group, Inc., BRG. We commend your dedication and commitment to the arts. September 18, 2021, signed Barbara Lee, Congresswoman, United States House of Representatives. Thank you, Congressman Barbara Lee. Thank you, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, uh, with the United States House of Representatives. What a great honor uh, that you would honor us at this time. And we're grateful. We're grateful, very much grateful. Well, at this point, to... excuse me, uh, at this point, we're going to roll the credits and the wonderful soundtrack by Greg. 
Greg White that may put the sound the sound together for it and the, and the credits for the wonderful people who worked on the show. So, and when we come back, we're coming to the post conversation and jam session. So don't go nowhere, folks. It's going to be more of the Jimi Hendrix experience for all. Stay right there. We're coming right back. Yes, we're back. We're yes, back. we're back. And uh, how are you feeling, brother? I'm feeling very good. I'm feeling very good. Got it. Got through about a what three or four thousand words. <laughs> Woo! Woo. <laughs> and thank you for being behind. You know, making it all happen. Uh, you know, technically and everything. 
this is our first th time out of the gate. You know, when we do shows in theater, we have what they call uh, previews until yes. we really open it up. So that gives you time to get out the, all the cranks and cranks, but we're good. And I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, Jeff Wright and uh, Rudy Kronfuss is going to be joining us from the Netherlands. Once again, thank you, Rome, uh, the Jimmy Aquino Studios and uh, Brooklyn Heights. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Grace Cambridge for being a script editor Could and say, just just being say, great. I'm sorry. Could you say something about the next your next um, show that's coming up, Jimmy Hendrix? Yeah, October the first, we're doing Electric Lady. Oh boy, there it is. Uh, Women in the Life of Jimi Hendrix. Uh, just incredible. Now we get a chance to talk about what these women thought about Jimi Hendrix, intimately about Jimi Hendrix, the kind of man he was. I think I was inspired by this story because I kept hearing the loud guitar, the loud wow brother, the wow man of Borneo. And then I was hearing about quiet, gentlemanly like. And then I began to want to write that story and eventually met people like Rosalie Brooks and uh, Monica Daneman um, would write, uh, wrote me a few letters. Um, I got a chance to have a conversation of 12 years with Fame Pricknan and just began to get some, um, you know, firsthand information. Hey, Rudy, how you doing? Hey, Greg. All right. Mike Jones in the house. We got these heavyweights. <laughs> <laughs> we got these heavyweights. And uh, maybe Jimmy Blue will be joining us and Juma. And, uh, but this is great. Is Rosalie nearby? She should be here, getting here shortly. Um, here. Yes, Juma. My brother Juma, how you doing? Bless you, brother. Okay, Juma Satan, there's Jimmy Blue. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? Hook up, hook up. Jimmy Blue in the house. Jimmy, Jimmy from, Jimmy's coming in probably from Brooklyn or he's probably on the road. Juma is in uh, Seattle. Rudy Crumfus is in right, uh, the right. Netherlands. Mike Jones is in Los Angeles. Greg Wright is in Los Angeles. And uh, I think we are looking for uh, Rosalie to come on. Yeah. Juma Sultan. Juma Sultan. Yeah, what is it? Sultan, right. Sultan, Sultan. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, well, maybe, uh, maybe uh, Juma, um, maybe Rosalie is going to join us shortly. I know we, we uh, tuned in to her um, a few times uh, technically, so she should be set. Let's start okay. with Let's start with uh, Juma, uh, Juma Sultan, an incredible brother. I've had the opportunity to meet Juma three times. I don't know if you knew every time I met him, but I've always been a fan of him. First time I met you, Juma, was at the SOBs back in like 2001 or something when there was a something uh, by Janie and Joe and uh, Diane Hendricks, and I came down and got a chance to meet you. Then, of course, the times that you came to uh, play with and support Jimmy Blue at the Cafe Wa. And Juma, I, I want to ask you a question and you can add, you know, what you may want to add to it as well. But I wanted to ask a question specifically. Do you remember the Dick Cavett show? And you can add Woodstock with it. What was it like traveling and being a part of that, the personnel around you and what was Jimmy like during that time? I, I obviously, I, I, he respected you and, and knew you, but could you share some stories around the Dick Cavett show and the Woodstock Festival? Yeah, well, uh, as we all know, the Dick Cavett show, uh, he did it after the Woodstock, but the uh, yeah. situation was that uh, uh, he wanted to have the whole band there and the management. Uh, only wanted a trio, and so when they went to the house, they uh, left everyone's instrument at the house. And so this is in, uh, uh, you know, but it was very interesting. Uh, the thing about the Dick Cavett show, I think it was one uh, a clear uh, a picture of uh, Jimmy, uh, you know, in reference to uh, his persona. Uh, a lot of you know his interviews were. Uh, um, for, you know, uh, in, in different ways, and 
you know, this one, I thought he had a lot, a lot of clarity, uh, you know, in his interview. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Do you remember the last time you saw Jimi Hendrix? Yeah, the last time I saw him was about, uh, oh, I don't know, we like a city line about six o'clock, seven in the morning, uh, the day that he left for Europe to go to do the concert at the Isle of Wight. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Were you at the uh, Band of Gypsies concert uh, that, that New Year's Eve? Uh, no, 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 no. There was there was a lot of problems with the management administration at that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, I wasn't at the uh, at the concert. You know, because uh, um, he was in and out of the studio a lot, but um, uh, he was also going over uh, to uh, to go ride the baggies. And uh, rehearsing with Buddy and uh, and Billy. Gotcha. And uh, if and I will, I'm going to come back to you. But um, what would you like to leave the audience that's here now? You know, obviously, in one way or another, he has inspired so many people on so many levels. Musicianship, just the audacity to do what you love and 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 be. Uh, and be international known, you know, by it. Is there anything that you can uh, share with us that uh, about Jimi Hendrix? Just anything that, you know, may come to mind. And also tell us, Juma, what are you doing these days? Thank you. Well, uh, the Jimmy, uh, his, his influence and his uh, on the music and you know, uh, and uh, is uh, so adult. I mean, the spirit lives today through uh, just so many genres. So uh, uh, he is still influencing people, you know, all of these uh, number of generations. I think it's probably been about five now. And so uh, that's what, uh, what I could go in terms of uh, creativity. Uh, he's uh, just. Uh, I guess nothing that I really expect. So, uh, in terms of his his influence uh, over the arts. Wow, awesome! What are you doing these days, Juma? I know you are out in uh, Seattle now with uh, Tina Hendrix and the Jimi Hendrix well, Institute. Well, they, they had a memorial celebration today for uh, mm -hmm. to uh, for the out of the uh, memorial celebration and. Uh, also, a lot of people are not uh, familiar with the uh, Hendrix Music Academy, which uh, they afford you know, people an opportunity to, uh, to uh, learn instruments and learn music. And, uh, uh, and basically, uh, they offer free uh, music lessons to uh, uh, youngsters of all levels. Those are the opportunities that are seeking an opportunity. Mm hmm. Oh, there's Rosalie. I recommend. It's wonderful. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and and right now I'm working on a. I've uh, been working last year on a, a, a rhythm and blues album with uh, uh, Daniel Benzeva, who was the uh, the conga player for Richie Havens uh, at um, uh, with you know a lot of people in the band. Wonder. I mean, he's a big singer in the band. Working on an RBI lab, uh, one of the things, you know, and we eventually uh, hope to, to uh, go into the archives and bring things forward like you're doing presently here uh, mm -hmm. on podcasts and uh, various other projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Juma. Juma, still, please stick around. We're going to go around and, and, and talk to everybody, and perhaps we can talk together too. I understand Sister Rosalie Brooks has joined us from Los Angeles, California. And uh, I remember, well, I remember when I met her back in like, how you doing, Rosa? Well, I had the darnest time trying to get in. Um, yeah, that's how this I'm technology doing fine, is. though, and I really enjoyed your segment. Great, great, great. Oh, great you. information and just really good storytelling. And uh, thank you for that. You know, thank, thank you for inviting me. 
Yeah, we're still working on it. So that's our that's our coming out party. So we can build from here. But I, I just wanted to share with everyone that I had the honor of meeting Rosalie way back in the 90s. And that was shortly after me and um me and Ricky Rouse was invited over to Amsterdam. And Rudy Kronfus, who's on this call here coming in from Amsterdam, was part of that group with uh, so many wonderful artists. And uh and I had the opportunity um I don't know exactly what kind of brought us together, but I know that Anthony Johnson was around and and uh, and I told him about you and I think he ended up in L.A. And we all ended up there together. Me, Ricky lived in L.A. and, and um, Anthony came uh, eventually around and, uh, and I said, well, they're all out in L.A. I need to get out there, too. So I'm not going to wait a while. Yeah, we had a great time. Um, we had a great time, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> But, but Rosa, you know, you were now what, what always I'm as, I'm always so excited about people who really knew Jimi Hendrix even before he was a major star. And you you knew him when he was playing background with Little Richard. Right. And uh, let me ask you this question. What what do you think has kept his legacy alive for so long? What is the. Uh, I know his spirit. And it touched so many people so many ways. I'm not a, I'm, I play percussions. I play a, a, I play a little bit of guitar. If all these guys in the building, I'm on the corner trying to come down the street. <laughs> so, but uh, what, what is, what, what did you think has kept Jimi Hendrix so essential and pertinent? Um, I can point? say uh, he was a very unique individual, one of a kind. At that particular time, I mean, um, he had something that no one else had at that particular time. Um, he was magical. He had a great presence. Uh, he had a talent and ability like no one else. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And uh, I know, Rosa, you're still, we're going to come back to you, Rosa. I'm just going to try to get around to everybody. But I know you're still doing your music. You're still in Los Angeles uh, <laughs> doing your blues. And you, <laughs> and actually, your house has become, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of a showcase for so many uh, blues artists who have come through your house. I remember one of the fascinating stories you told me once, that you lived across the street from the guy's who used to sing Natural High, Natural Sky. Oh, Hives. yeah, Bloodstone. Bloodstone. Uh, Bloodstone lived across, well, actually, Charles Love, the guitar mm -hmm. player and singer in Bloodstone's band. Mm -hmm. Him and his family lived across the street. And I'll tell you a little quick, quick story. On the day we had the debut of the Natural High album, mm -hmm. uh, Robin Russell, rest mm -hmm. in peace, showed up, he lived around the corner on 65th place from me. Mm. And he showed up to see what the heck was going on because I had my stereo unit outside. I had the booming system. So we were, were debuting the High album that day mm -hmm. when I met 17-year-old Robin Russell for the first time, 51 years ago. Wow, wow, that's amazing. Wow. Well, yeah, hold on, Rosa. We got more stories, uh, and and I know you have more things to share. We're gonna try to get around to everybody. Um, I'm not seeing everybody on the screen, but I know who's present. I'm gonna go to J Jimmy Blue. Jimmy Blue is just incredible. Oh yeah, he is like the epitome of. I think you know you. <laughs> I, you know, I believe in the word that says your gift will make room for you and present you bet before great men and women. And Jimmy's been at it for a moment. I remember think, seeing him back in the 80s in New York City. But he has come to a place where um, he is so well respected and so bountifully supported all over the United States and all over the world. I see his shows and in BB Kings and Cafe Wa, and he plays larger stages than that all around the world, much larger stages. But man, has he um, 
It has been incredible. And Juma has sat in with him, and he's played with he he's played with Billy Cox. And uh, but hello, Jimmy. Thank you, brother, for uh, joining us. And uh, and so, Jimmy, one of my first questions: What was it that inspired you to want to do Jimi Hendrix music? I mean, I mean, you have your own music. You've written your own music. You've recorded your own music. You have a variety of musicians, and uh, you know that you, that you like as well as you know all of us. But you, you know, you have Al Green and James Brown and other people that you really like. What what really inspired you to say I want to play this music and 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 present it to the people? Hmm. Well, even before I, I answer that, just let me say, uh, hotel to everybody. And I'm honored to be sitting here with just some of the, some heavy hitters in the game. Uh, my sister Rosa, for, for one, my blood brother Juma, uh, just right there. I mean, I'm just honored to be even thought of to be among these these people. Uh, what what inspired me with Jimmy was the mysticism that he held in in black music. Mm -hmm. it's simple as that. That that inspired me, and. Uh, the consciousness that he infused in uh, black rock, the, what they call quote unquote black rock. But it's, it's the mysticism that inspired me to get into who I am as an individual that came through Jimi Hendrix. He was a way shower for me. Mm -hmm. And that's that's more important than the music to me. Uh, mm -hmm. That actually, uh, I mean, yes, the guy was incredible what he did, he changed the game. But uh, I, I didn't want to spend the, the rest of my life trying to be Jimi Hendrix. I, I had to find out who I was, and thanks to him at a very young age, I was able to do that. Mm. Mm. that that's that's great, Jimmy, because I, I know you always you always approach Jimi Hendrix first from a deep spiritual level, and uh, and out of that level comes, you know, what has inspired you, what has molded you, and what you move on to be. And I know you got some exciting things ahead of you, um, in reference to what you're doing and some film work and, and the tours. Um, I'm going to go around the room a little bit and we're going to come back to you and, and, and talk about that as well. Um, but just a phenomenal, a phenomenal musician. Just got to see him to believe him. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Rudy Kronfus. Hey, Rudy, thank you for joining us from Amsterdam. Hello. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Thank you, sir, for joining us from Amsterdam. I know that you discovered uh, Jimmy's music in Europe, and uh, you were, I think you lived in Austria, was it? I, I was born in Vienna, and I grew up in Vienna, exactly. Okay. And uh, I know that you have an incredible book uh, that you have uh, written on Jimi Hendrix uh, a tour. That's wonderful. We got to get that book, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix in Vienna. And, uh, but, you know, I had the opportunity to work with you, uh, Rudy, in um, in Amsterdam, with uh, so many wonderful, incredible. My people. dear, it has been thirty years yes, ago. Sir. With Buddy uh, Miles and Nora Redding, right? And Andy Hansen, and that's right. where I met Monica Daneman. Right. Cecil Gleibick was there, and 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 people don't know him. He wrote the book Electric Gypsy, and and just so many people, man. But you know, I was honored that you asked me to sing. <laughs> with you, and uh, I appreciate that. And and with the uh, Lords of the Rings. Uh, well, well, I heard you. I heard you singing uh, uh, backstage, and so so I really uh, enjoyed. Uh, you were singing all the time, so th that was a, a main reason to invite you. Well, thank you, brother. That was such a glorious time in my life, and to be on tour with you guys. I, I just couldn't believe it. There I was in a doggone band with Buddy Miles and Nora Redding. <laughs> Traveling throughout Europe, it's just crazy. But you know, Rudy, from where you are, what 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 was your um uh oh uh okay yes is if if is Tiger Taylor around? Please join us. But uh, what was your inspiration, um, um, Rudy, in terms of Jimmy's music, and what kept you what kept you interested in still playing it? Well, first of all, I I grew up. Uh, in a very uh, conservative uh, environment, Vienna is 2,000 years old, and uh, because of the two world wars, it, 
it's very, uh, uh, it, it was, uh, at that time I grew up, there were more people dying than born because of the war. So th it was a very conservative place. And uh, Jimmy helped me, Jimmy's music helped me to really um, digest all this old stuff and to get out into, into a, new, uh, a new vibe. Because before Jimmy, I, 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 was, I was into Beatles and Rolling Stones, and especially also in The Who. Uh, but, but when I first heard Jimmy, it was, it was a total different thing. And um, I, it never, it never, I never got rid of Jimmy, because uh, Jimmy, he, uh, he, uh, he had this spiritual aspect in his music, which, uh, which kind of touched me right away. It it was like like uh, it was it was just a brother. It it was it was just uh, he talk, he was talking my language, gotcha. and uh, and uh, uh, I'm I'm born in a very musical family, so uh, so uh, all, all I was surrounded by music all the time, but mostly classical music, and all this old music. But so my father and people they they thought I was crazy listening to that noise, uh, what they called Jimmy <laughs> Hendrix. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, it was very in in the environment where I come from. Jimi Hendrix was was, was something what what you would avoid. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it yeah. was it was uh, something out of tune. It was something crazy, and uh, so I had to fight my own space and defend uh, the things that I liked. So in the, uh, when I was very young, it was kind of weird. Uh, be belonging to a very small group of people who enjoy Jimi Hendrix. Mm, there you go. We're going to come back to you, Rudy. Uh, thank you. All right. We're going to talk about what you're doing now and, and how you're moving forth. I wanted to also say that uh, Rosalie Brooks, who's with us right now, Electric Lady is the next play on October the 1st, and it tells her story as I've heard it from her. And I, she don't, may not know, I remember it so well. And I've written it down. It's such a beautiful story. And I, one thing I remember is Sleepwalk by Santos and Pepe. <laughs> she, she said how they were on the beach and, and, and that music was playing probably out of the car stereo. But we're going to come back to Rosa. But I wanted to move to a brother, um, Greg Wright, who works with Rosa in Los Angeles. Greg has worked with Michael Jackson on the Michael Jackson tour. Um, he has worked uh, with Eddie uh, Van Halen. And uh, he's just worked with so many other people that he that I don't know. And he could share that with us, spent a lot of time in uh, New Orleans. And uh, but, uh, you know, you know, uh, Greg, you're, you're phenomenal. And, and Rosie introduced me uh, to you and introduced, you know, you to others. And your music has obviously transcended around the world, too, because of let's face it, if you're traveling with Michael Jackson, you're going just about everywhere. But um, um, you, um, I want to say, what has been your inspiration? How did Jimmy's music touch you? How did his life, his style, his clothing, his spiritual awareness, what was it about it that said, I'm going to, I'm going to continue, I'm going to play this guy. I mean, I mean I'm going to play his music. I know you have your own music which we're so grateful that you lent your music to this particular production. And, uh, but what is it that kept you going with Jimmy's music? Um, the first rock concert I ever went to, strangely enough, was Jimi Hendrix. Mm. And uh, I was about 15, maybe 16 years old. And when I went there, uh, you know, I, I played guitar, but I was just, you know, guitar was just a side hobby. And uh, I was really more interested in sports. Yeah. And whoever I was at the beginning of that concert, the, the athlete, the football player, whatever, by the time that concert was over, that guy had died and went to heaven. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went home after that concert. You know, I didn't say much on the drive home. But when I got home, my father was sitting in his easy chair. And, you know, he asked me, he said, hey, how was your concert, son? And I looked at him and I just said, pop, football is over. <laughs> really shocked. 
<laughs> yeah. Really shocked him. He was like, man, what's this? He said, well, so what you going to do with your life? I said, man, I'm going to be I'm going to be a professional guitar player. I'm going to be a professional musician. That's what I want to do with my life. Because before that concert was over, I knew. I knew right then and there what I was going to do. I could see my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like Jimmy Blue was saying earlier, you know, Jimi Hendrix kind of pointed the way. And one of the things I wanted to mention that uh, I saw at that concert that really shocked me. Because uh, I've always been kind of... What, what I call one of them alternative brothers, okay? I kind of moved to the left a little bit. You know, some people would call, you know, when I was a kid, they'd call me weird, but, you know, that's just a little bit old. But uh, one of the things I saw at that concert that I was completely shocked is how many black people I saw at that concert wearing bandanas and fringe jackets and beads and I was we was all looking at each other like well what are you doing here what are you doing here you know <laughs> it was like what like nobody could believe it but you know mm. as Otis Renny said a lot of black hippies oh wow wow what city was that in Greg that you first saw Jimmy that was uh Baltimore Maryland a place called the Baltimore Civic Center it's still there yeah, that's amazing. Now, I see your guitar. Is it upside down? Are you left-handed? Yes. Get out of here. Get out of here. We got two. Well, we may have more than two, but I know Jimmy is left-handed, Jimmy Blue, and you're a left-handed guitar player, too, man. We're going to come back to you because I know you have something else to uh, share with us. Um, I don't see everybody, but I know Mike Jones is in the house. And uh, hey, Mike, how you doing? Good, good. How about yourself, Jones? I've been good, man. It's so great to we still haven't met, <laughs> but but it's still it's great to see you moving and talking to me because I've seen your bits of, of playing Jimmy, and you're ferocious, man. You go in <laughs> and uh, and you got a great uh, you got a great following of people who you know really respect your your music. And you were out, um, I think you were out in Minneapolis, uh, probably doing some soul work out there. And you went to, you went to Prince studio as well, right? Right, right. We were out doing a thing with uh, Jelly Bean Johnson, who was an also a uh, graduate of the school of Jimmy. <laughs> and okay, yeah. uh, we had a blast. We had Get a blast. out of here. You know, I think the incredible thing about you, uh, Mike, is uh, <laughs> I was, I lived in Ashland, Oregon for two years. <laughs> And I met a barber. He's cutting my hair. And we're talking about Jimi Hendrix. And he said, I got a buddy, Mike Jones, who I grew up with, who plays Jimi Hendrix. I said, I know Mike Jones. I haven't met him, but I've seen him. So that brother, that's a great brother. He's Mike too, Mike Diaz, right? Mike Diaz, right. Is Mike still cutting hair? Yeah. I believe so. And he was yeah. a great drummer when he was playing. Okay, great. Yeah, he said he used to play with you. But man, um, what what what's Jimi Hendrix's inspiration to your life and your music, man? Because I, you know, you go in, brother, and I really respect. Um, know, it's the way I put it is Jimmy actually changed the course of my life. Okay. Um, I was I was a lot like Greg. You know, I wanted to be the athlete. I was playing football, yeah. Yeah. and when I wasn't playing football, that's when I played guitar. When football season came in, that was like my number one thing until my senior year in high school when I got my knee blown out and I laid in the hospital bed and I thought, football, guitar, football, guitar, and guitar won. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing that, like, I come from a football career in uh, high school, played football in high school. I, pl mm. I ran track in elementary school. As we mm. can see, mm. Jimmy played oh, football. Amazing. It's amazing. But uh, yeah, yeah. So we got these athletes here that, but I know that Jimmy moved my, inspired me towards the arts, you know, more, more so. When I heard Band of Gypsies, I graduated from the Jackson Five and James Brown to listen to Jimmy Hendrix. I, I thought I had grown up because the music was so sophisticated. I like, wow, what in the world is this? I used to have this little tape record in Augusta, Georgia, and Corey Washington is living in Augusta, Georgia now. And an incredible historian. He's going to be with us uh, for Electric uh, Lady and, and Rosalie as well. But uh, 
I used to walk down the street with a real, you know, those little cassettes we used to have and record it from the high five playing. Who knows? It was the most, it was the most incredible thing. Uh, I mean, that, that I thought I had ever heard up until that point. Cause I was just all into the Jackson five and James Brown and Motown. But, uh, but man, thank you for sharing your story. Um, we're going to come back to you. I just want to get to everybody first. I think Jerome, uh, I, Jerome, I think you've gotten to everyone. I want to hear some music from somebody. <laughs> well, maybe. Okay. Well, um, now I, <laughs> that depends on if somebody wants to play. <laughs> so, well, you know, Greg, I see a guitar on Greg. Greg yeah, I was, I was just showing off my strap. Was- <laughs> <laughs> These brothers make money, man. You know, Jimmy Blue is like probably, dude. I see a guitar on Greg. <laughs> Jimmy Blue is probably like saying, dude, you you gonna catch out me <laughs> for some chords? <laughs> uh, Greg, since you have the guitar, do you want to hit a lick or two? Yeah, sure. Please let us share us with share a lick or two. <laughs> 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 you got me on the first note. <laughs> you got me on the first note. Yes. Lord, you were there on the first note. I didn't even have to catch up. I mean, I, I, I was like, let me see if he's in it. You hit me on the first note, man. I'm so grateful. We don't have a lot of time, Rome, so, you know. Okay, can't... Mike, come on, Mike. Bring something to the table. <laughs> Mike Jones going to mess Jimmy you up. Jimmy inspired. Mike Jones going to mess you up. <laughs> I don't know what you just asked. Right. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Mike, you took me to church. You took me to church. I'm sorry. That's that's Jimmy inspired, right? That's yeah, kind of a right. Jimmy inspired tune. And Rosa, it's just Rosalie. Rosalie, you gonna do a little tune with with Greg Wright? You want me and Greg to do something? Uh, Rosalie. Well, let's let's uh let's friend. even the, let's even the feel, Rome, because we want to now. So Rosa and Greg, let's let's see. 
I know you guys. I think you guys had something. She's singing? She Not froze, yet, I think. Put your mind together. That's like a little... <laughs> but come on, because you see, we're holding hands oh, yeah. and we watch the sunrise <laughs> from the bottom of the sea. Not... <laughs> Just go sing. I'll catch up with you. Don't worry about it. I think she's frozen. Come on. If you could just put your eyes to something. Hey, Greg. Hey, Greg, you know what we'll do? Greg, you know what we'll do? Have you ever been hey. experienced? Rosa, why don't you start singing? Acoustically, and then Greg will fill fill in. I think obviously he's doing all you all you experience. Yeah. Okay, listen, guys. Let me tell you something. That's that's how this thing works. Um, you have to have space between the instrument and the voice. Yeah. So there's a, there's yeah. a uh, call and response, and you'll get a clear sound. It's not easy because it's delayed sound. She hears it. Latency, she yeah. hears it uh, a little later after it's played. Hi. Rosa, you can um you can start out acoustically. And, uh, okay, we're here. we're listening. It's breaking up. With her. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to move on because uh, we're, we're faced with the tyranny of the clock. <laughs> and uh, this, this has been a wonderful, mobtastic happening today. She's still singing. Go ahead, girl. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to know. Man. Well, her connection is totally breaking up. Yeah, the connection is not good on that. Uh, not good. So, uh, Jacob, Jimmy Blue, did you want to share a little something? No, I'm just listening to everybody. You got some great insight, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Rudy, did you did you play? I, I cannot play. I'm hurt because I had an accident. Next time that's I'm right. gonna play. That's right. You told I, me. I only Rudy. can sing. Okay. Okay, gotcha. That's right. That's what you told me. Um, um, hey, Juma, I, I I I assume you've met most of these gentlemen. It's uh, breaking up. It's breaking. I know you've met. You just me, but Rosa. Still talking and broke up. Yeah, I think Rosa's connection is a little, um, it's kind of, yes, it's weak. I was going to say, Juma, you, uh, I know you've worked with or met most of these gentlemen. Um, is there anyone uh, here that you haven't uh, had a chance to hear or is are you being introduced to anyone for the first time? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, got 
Jones. We've got a few people. I've heard of them. I've never had the opportunity. I've seen uh, a number of people on here that I have not had an opportunity. Uh, Rosa and I would go way back, uh, way before. I can't remember. Uh, right. Not as far as, you know, but uh, I think it was the first time or even before that. So, um, but uh, Jimmy and I went back, way back, because he didn't tell you that, you know, that he, he started the Jimmy Hendrix Fan Club when he was a little kid in elementary school. So yeah. That are, that are very interesting. And so, uh, but, uh, um, I haven't met the majority of the people. Who know. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, and I know um, Jimmy has heard that story, being like uh, one of the presidents of the fan club when he was a teenager, and I think Jimmy uh, met Jimi Hendrix. Oh, was that right, Jimmy? You you met him during that time when oh, he came to your school and played or something like that. Would yeah, you mind that yeah. Story? I, I wasn't the president. The vice president actually went to my high school. Okay. But uh, yeah, I was you know, 15 or 16 and was in the fan club and uh, got to see him a lot being chased out of the office, um, Warner's office by Trixie, Second, Mike's secretary a lot. I still remember that. Still remember, uh, I, you know, complaining that the British fan club got more perks than we did. We we got nothing. They, they got everything. But uh, I guess we got like I said earlier, the consciousness uh, from Jimmy, me and a few other cats. Jimmy uh, recommended Berkeley College to me. Uh, uh, I attended Berkeley on his recommendation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Rome, let me get back to you. How much time we have and is there anything you'd like to uh, add or ask? I'd just like to say that this has been truly a privilege and pleasure to be acquainted with all these gentlemen, these artists, and uh, this pro this whole program started when you, Jerome, came on board to do my banana pudding jazz event, and the event was entitled Seven Guitars. And seven jazzy had, guitarists. Yes, seven jazzy guitars. And since you had um, performed Seven Guitars on Broadway, August Wilson's play, I thought it was apropos for you to come in and do some monologues from the play. And then you had the opportunity to meet Dr. Mona Scott of the Black Theater, Black uh, Repertory Group. And then this whole idea of Jimmy and the trilogy of Jimmy evolved. And it started with yeah. you coming to me with this idea of bringing back my directorship <laughs> For a Jimmy project, which we started, was it 30? 1991. 91, yeah, whoa. Yeah. So we started back there, and um, it's been a love fest. I, guys, I enjoyed each and every one of you, your stories. I enjoyed the tech stuff that we've done together. And when I do seven guitars again, I'm calling a couple of you cats to be a part of that experience. With me for my <laughs> but that's and, and that was a great. I I, I just want to say how much I enjoyed your presentation because it was great. It was great. It was informative, and uh, can't wait to see you do more. Thank you, sir. We're we're um yeah we're building on it from there, and I I'm I'm grateful that those words came out of my mouth and. Uh, I wrote that uh, back in June because the original play, when Dr. Mona came to me, I said, well, Dr. Mona, I'm three times Jimmy's weight and I'm three times his age. I don't do, I don't do Jimi Hendrix no more. <laughs> and I said, but I can come up with a story that, uh, that we can appreciate. And, uh, and it's amazing that it would come through Rome Neal because Rome does a one man Thelonious Monk. Uh, <laughs> it's an incredible one man Thelonious monk. Yeah, he, 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 he's taking that. that he's taking it to Africa. Mm. He's been really I mean he's but 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 we worked way back before he even was doing Thelonious Monk. He was doing he was directing me and, and Jimi Hendrix and something I had written and, and taken around and uh so it was great to come through that. But if I would say, can I just pass through I, I just wanna uh you know get a, a last word of anything you guys may want to say, what you're doing next. Anything you want to lend to the people that are there? Anything you want to lend to guitarists, new guitarists out there, young men that are coming up? We'll start with Rudy and we go with Mike, Greg, and uh, Jimmy, 
and then uh, Juma can be last. Rudy, Rudy. All right, I, I shall. I have to start with this. Uh, what I want to say to young people is just uh, believe your own heart. Just get influenced by everything around you, but most of all, just believe your own heart because your own heart knows everything. And uh, don't copy anybody. Just t take inspiration from everywhere you can. Right. So uh, Jimmy okay. is is a great musician. But, uh, but don't copy Jimmy's mistakes because he didn't like that. G Jimmy was very angry <laughs> at people uh, uh, copying his mistakes. So don't do that, okay? And uh, I'm, I'm telling you that because I have a, I have a phone connection with Jimmy. And uh, he, he sometimes tells me things that, that uh, people don't know here on, on this tiny planet. All right? Gotcha. That's my message. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rudy. <laughs> Hey, Mike. That's great, Rudy. Thank you. <laughs> what you like to share with us, Mike? Hey, I just want to say it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with such talent and with everyone. Um, Rosa, I know I haven't seen you in a while, but our time is coming, sweetheart. It's been way too long. And it's because of her that I've met so many of these talented musicians in the L.A. area, Greg Wright included. Um, October the 9th, I'm going to be in Irvine, California, Southern California, doing the uh, Irvine Village Global Festival. We'll be doing our Jimmy tribute there. Uh, going to be off the chain, of course, fresh off from my Minneapolis trip. So I'm about to have some fun. And I just yeah. want to say it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. And Juma, I hope to meet you in person one day soon, too. God bless you. All everyone. right. Awesome, man. Hey, Greg. Cheryl and Rosa, I, I didn't see you there. That's why I didn't call you. But please, I want you to uh, speak after uh, Juma. But Greg? Yes, sir. Well, I just want to say how much uh, I enjoyed this and uh, how much I learned. And being on with uh, all these great artists is just an honor and a privilege. And I'd also like to shamelessly self-promote my new album coming out at the end of this month called Big Dog Barking. Big dog barking. Greg Wright. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, Thank you sir. so much. Uh, we have uh, Jimmy, Bl Jimmy Blue. Uh, yeah, as I said earlier, it's an honor to be with everybody here. Uh, more information about uh, what I do, you can go to kisstheskytribute.com. That's kisstheskytribute.com for my uh, re recreation of uh, what Jimmy's doing. And also... Uh, my personal website is newdivinitysfc.com, and that's my uh, personal website. And looking forward to seeing everybody here again. Hotel Pool. Okay. Uh, everybody still hang on because we're going to do just one little small thing before we go. But now we have, is it Juma? Juma? Yeah, Juma Sultan, correct. Juma, yeah. Juma Sultan, yes, sir. Well, I, I think that uh, uh, Jimmy inspired uh, his his web op, uh, influence over all all this that uh, are popular. Uh, it was like uh, I, I remember when we were up up in uh, Woodstock. I mean, he listened to everyone from Coltrane. He had a chance to play with uh, Ross Donald and Kirk, uh, Ro Kirk, and uh, he his 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 taste was was wide open. And uh, I hear people uh, talk about it. And, uh, I mean, other than uh, recreation or, or, or something, uh, his influence was uh, to uh, not play what he played, but play, uh, open up the heart and mind. And he was hitting, uh, as far as I was concerned, sacred chords or you know, universal. So uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's possible to define his music like his not really possible to define things like people talk about love and God and all the other things goes beyond that. So uh, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juma. And, uh, and, and Rosalie, you want to take us home with a few words? Are you there? So, Rose. Uh, Rosie, if you can hear me, we'd love to hear uh, some uh, last words from you. Are you there? She's there. That the the connection is. Uh, did we get everybody a chance to talk? 
Think so. Yeah. Well, once again, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Dr. Mona Scott and Sean uh, Von Scott out at the Black Repertory Theater in Berkeley, California, um, who gave us the platform to present this play. October the first, we're doing Electric Lady. We have a wonderful cast. And most of that will be on my uh, my Facebook page, and we'll be getting out. There. We have a, a, a wonderful group of ladies, and one gentleman who's going to be playing Biko Eisen, who's going to be playing Jimi Hendrix in that. I want to thank Rome Neal, um, and there's the flyer there. Um, I want to thank Rome Neal, who um, you know, who has put all of this together and inspired this, and. Uh, put all the uh, programming together, put all the credits together, um, you know, the well, sound and, 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 and this wonderful stuff, connecting all the people uh, that were a part of our guests. So I, I want to thank everyone. And I just, first of all, I just want to thank these guests. Uh, excuse and, me, one, uh, second, one second. I just like, I don't want to interrupt you, but it was my son, Rome, Rome Kenneal, who did the video and put the... Um, Montage together for, for the in, the in, with the intro and ex, extra of the show, and put all those elements together, and I have to give credit to him, Rome uh, Ken Neal, who's um, director of the new Black Black Theater Project documentary that's coming out soon. Awesome, awesome. So thank you, Rome Ken Neal, and Rome Neal, and. Rome has a, a blessed, beautiful family and a, and a glorious house. So we're just so grateful that he also um, lent his uh, talent to this. And I want to just personally thank every last one of these incredible musicians. And I'm grateful. My heart is filled that you said yes and came aboard. There's a lot of things you could have done. There's a lot of things you could have thought to do but I'm more than grateful that you would. From Juma Sultan, I've been, been inspired by you, man, your great presence, and we, you're one of, uh, you know, you're the elder amongst us, and we, are, we love you like a brother. Um, you know, uh, Mike Jones, haven't known you for a few years, brother, but you, you bring it in, and I, I'm just so, so, so grateful that you said yes. And Greg Wright, um, so grateful, man, for your gracious and beautiful gift. And as you continue to work with Rosa and do your work and your new album, we're grateful for you. Thank you. Um, Rudy Krumfus, thank you so much. I know it's about 2 a.m. where you are. But, thanks, thanks. No problem. <laughs> but uh, you stayed up and hung in there with us. And Rome Neal called you and got you programmed. And Rome just did an incredible job making sure you guys were in. Uh, Ricky Rouse wanted to be with us. He said, yes, 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 yes. But Ricky's phone just could not carry the signal. And he's incredible. He's just an amazing brother who was also on the tour with us over there in uh, Amsterdam. And uh, Jimmy Blue, um, uh, Jimmy Blue, bless your heart, brother. Um, thank you so much for saying yes, Jimmy. You my brother here in New York City. I'm going to talk to you soon. Uh, now that this is over, I, I got some breathing room. And I get back with you in some of the things we talked about, but man, you you are just incredible. You, all of you guys are just phenomenal. I guess I've seen Jimmy perform more than anybody. Every time he's in New York, I'm right there. If he's in Pittsburgh, I tell somebody to go see Jimmy Blue. If he's in Los Angeles, I say go see Jimmy Blue. But all of you guys just incredible. I'm sorry. No, I'm not gonna forget Rosa. And all of you guys are incredible. Now, now I don't see Rosa. But, you know, um, Rosalie, bless your heart. You know, if I'm anywhere near Los Angeles, I try to come see you. And I was there two years ago just for a couple of days. Uh, Tina knows Beyonce's mom has a theater out in North Hollywood. And we were doing a, a rehearsal there. And I had about two hours. And I put my GPS in and I went over to South Central. <laughs> and uh, I got to you. And so I just, I love you, Rosa. We love you. Yeah. We're so grateful for you. You are inspirational. You're inspiration. You keep going. You keep us going. 
Oh, boy, you've done so many things. And, of course, you came out of the gate in terms of Jimmy with the UT and uh, My Diary. And uh, Rosalie Brooks' story will be told in Electric Lady. we got a wonderful sister, Sophia Coffey Loren. Sophia's from Chicago. She lives in New York now. She's an incredible, incredible actress and singer. And she's going to bring Rosalie to life. And... Uh, well, she's already living, so you don't have to bring her to life. <laughs> but she's she's going to present uh, Rosalie to us, and uh, she does an incredible job. So uh, thank you so much, Rosa. Thank you so much, everybody that has tuned in. And as you can see, I don't want to let you go, but I have to. <laughs> it's been that does mean peace, not this peace. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know. All should be taken lightly like a woodpecker with a headache. Oh, that's George Clinton. <laughs> but, uh, hey, man. Uh, it was a pleasure, you guys. You guys. Thank you. Uh, June, you. Tell, tell Just your keep daughter. that fire going. Keep the fire going. Yes, yes. Going to be in touch with you guys. Juma, please tell your daughter thank you as I'll send out a thank you as well. I'm grateful. I'm grateful right. for everybody who joined in. And once again, thank you, uh, uh, Rome and we're live from uh, the Jimmy Aquino studio in Brooklyn Heights and uh, the script editor uh, Grace Cambridge who <laughs> doesn't like to be put on the spot <laughs> but uh, I'm so grateful that uh, <laughs> that everybody has come together to present this. God bless you and keep you may he cause his face to shine in the doors for you maybe he continue to pour favor into your life May this year be the best year ever, and may 2002 be a greater year than the years before. God has great things in store for you. You ain't seen nothing yet. Some of you have just started to scratch the surface of the doors that's going to be open for you in film, in television, in movies, in theater, and in your recording contract, in your recording careers. This is the best of the blessed that's before you. May God continue to keep you and get and bless you. Thank you, everybody who's tuned in, everybody who may be still here. I understand Tiger Taylor was with us, who used to hang out with Jimmy at his flat uh, with and in the group Air Parent. I'm, um, I, I'm so grateful to Tiger. I'm going to reach out to Tiger. I'd like to bring Tiger in on one of these conversations as well. There's so many people that uh, kind of lends to this spirit in this conversation. Thank you. And thank you, Rome. You can take us out. Okay, thank you so everyone so very much. Please stay tuned to the next Banana Putting Jazz, which is going to be September 25th. That's next week. That's a Saturday. That's my birthday. Uh, All right. Any of you cats are welcome to come on board and perform that day. I would appreciate it. But I'm, I'm getting the group together. We're going to have a great time. September 25th, Rome Mills, Banana Putting Jazz, celebrating my 60, 69th birthday. Thank you all for being a part of this Jimmy Hendrick experiment, which yes, uh, is you. an experience. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you guys so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.